We're about ready to go. I have no idea exactly when we're going to end. We'll get a signal when we run out of questions. But uh, before we begin the official proceedings of this last and uh, ever more exciting conference, uh, the next session will probably be run by uh, the, uh, the inaugurators of the, of the conference who would not thank themselves. So I want to say, as an old man, um, I'm Carl Amix. I'm one of five old guys who retired in 2016, just the other day. And we made way for this great Nouvelle Voix of uh, you know, new faculty at Notre Dame. And uh, some of them are here, Therese, and then uh, Katarina came. And I think uh, before we even hear from them later or have a, a last or a regular talk, we should thank them for organizing the whole series very heartily. <laughs> we couldn't have done it without you. And uh, I, for one, have enjoyed every session. And I can't wait to hear about Heidegger and Thon being, and we have a real expert here. So Mark will give us the last word in the regular session, please. Thanks. Um, and thank you to the organizers for um, running a seamless show here the last couple of days. And it's been a real pleasure to, to come to Notre Dame. Um, ordinarily, I'd say that um, Heidegger is the last paper in a very intense two-day session is a bad idea. Um, but I've felt at sea for the last couple of days. So, so to me, this is finally I can relax a little bit. But, um, <laughs> In his early work, Heidegger is a resolute critic of cognitivist models of human understanding. Uh, cognitive states like knowing, thinking, believing, representation, and propositional percep perceiving, he argues, are, this is quote one on the handout, they're not, not a primary, but a founded way of being in the world, a way that's always possible only on the basis of a non-cognizing comportment, end quote. Heidegger maintains, moreover, that a failure to recognize the derivative character of cognition is responsible for skewing most accounts of ontology. This is quote two. The priority which from ancient times has always been granted to cognitive comportment is at the same time connected with the peculiar tendency to define the being of the world in which human Dasein is, or human existence Dasein is, primarily in terms of how it shows itself for a cognitive comportment. In other words, the world's kind of being was characterized in terms of its specific objectivity for the cognition of the world. In some ways, that's what Sebastian was just talking about, I think. Um, this is not to say that Heidegger advocates a naively realist view of ontology, an ontology, that is, which is completely independent of human modes of understanding, as he puts it in quote three. Idealism affords the only correct possibility for a philosophical problematic, but that's only with the important proviso that idealism is taken, as he puts it in uh, passage four, idealism is taken as the view that reality is possible only in the understanding of being. But back to quote three, if idealism means the reduction of all entities to a subject or a consciousness, Heidegger warns, then this idealism is methodologically no less naive than the crudest realism. In a word, Heidegger's view is that being depends on human understanding, but that human understanding cannot be construed as a cognitive state. In his later work, Heidegger returns repeatedly, however, to the Parmenidean thought that being and thinking are the same, and argues for a peculiar intimacy between being and primordial thinking. Now, in part, this apparent change in his position is rooted in a change in the way that he th thinks of thinking and language. It's also in part a result of his developing an expanded account of what's involved in grounding being. Thus, Heidegger comes to hold the view that thinking does play a significant role in co-constituting being, but only provided that we understand thinking as a non-representational form of reflection on the ungroundedness of historical worlds. Um, my initial intention had been to talk about that later Heidegger um, today, but I found uh, it took me too long to work out the early Heidegger. So I'll only say a few things about that. Uh, okay, section one, cognition and being in early Heidegger. In being a time which is Heidegger's most sustained inquiry into ontology, Heidegger introduces the question of being in a way that ties being inextricably to human understanding. This is quote five. 
Being, he says, is that which determines entities as entities, that on the basis of which entities are in each case already understood, without regard to how we might analyze them. Already in this short introductory passage, we can discern two key features of Heidegger's account. First is the distinction between being and entities. Heidegger has a very broad view of what counts as an entity. It includes anything of which we can properly say that it is, including objects, properties, situations, and events. Being is a framework or structure that, as he puts it, frees entities to be, and without which they could not manifest themselves. Heidegger's ontology is an ontology of unconcealment, and there are two hallmarks of an ontology of unconcealment. First, it understands being as a structure in virtue of which entities can be disclosed to us, or in other words, being allows entities to figure in human activity. The second hallmark of an ontology of unconcealment is a recognition that entities enjoy some sort of independence from us, even if being does not. Being doesn't produce entities. It rather establishes the conditions under which they can manifest themselves as they are in themselves. Heidegger is an ontological pluralist. He thinks that there are fundamentally different kinds of entities, and accordingly, there are different kinds of ontological frameworks. For instance, many but not all entities only are if they have a spatio-temporal location. He, he adopts this Kantian idea as an important partial story to tell about being. So a spatio-temporal framework is an ontological condition for such entities to be, that is to be disclosed to us. So uh, as I noted, while entities are independent of us, ontological frameworks are not. As a result, spatio-temporally extended entities, to continue with the example, can only be discovered if there are human beings. But the spatio-temporal framework doesn't produce the entities it allows to appear. It doesn't cause them to come into existence. Instead, it lets them show up as intelligible to us. And this leads us to the second aspect of Heidegger's designation of being in passage five. Being is understood in advance of how we analyze or talk about being. Being is tied to unconcealment for beings like us, and unconcealment of being consists in making entities intelligible to us, but this doesn't mean that any particular thing only is if we already possess the resources to explain it. Rather, when something is, it's in the sphere of intelligibility. It shows up as at least potentially amenable to our coming to grips with it. But being is not reducible to how we talk or think about things. And that, I think, leads us into the issue of the derivative character of cognition. So section 1.1, Heidegger on the doubly derivative character of cognition. Uh, Heidegger's most detailed account of cognition is found in his 1925 lecture course on the history of the concept of time. And Heidegger here identifies two different senses in which cognition is a derivative phenomenon. First, Heidegger argues, this is quote six, that all cognition is only an appropriation and a kind of implementation of what is already discovered through other primary comportments. If anything, cognition only has the possibility of covering up what was originally discovered in non-cognitive comportment. So in passage six, Heidegger advances a derivation claim that we can call the appropriation thesis. The appropriation thesis states that cognition depends on non-cognitive forms of comportment because cognition appropriates for its own purposes the entities that are first discovered by these non-cognitive forms of comportment. The appropriation thesis distinguishes cognitive acts from other acts which discover particular entities in a non-cognitive fashion. And Heidegger thinks those other acts are more basic than cognition because they provide the initial articulation of the world that then gets taken up and appropriated in various ways in cognition. But Heidegger also points to a second sense in which cognition is derivative. You can see this in quote seven on the handout. Every cognition, Heidegger claims, is always already enacted on the ground of the kind of being of Dasein which we designate as being in, that is always already being at a world. And he elaborates in passage eight, cognition is nothing but a mode of being in the world. 
And indeed, it is not a primary, but rather a founded kind of being in the world, a way which is always possible only on the basis of a non-cognitive concordant. Now, in passages seven and eight, what he's pointing to uh, is a more basic form of derivation than that which is acknowledged by the appropriation thesis. Here, the claim is that there is a non-cognitive comportment, which is a condition of the possibility of any cognition. Uh, so let's call this Heidegger's founding thesis. According to the founding thesis, all cognitive acts are founded in a basic background state of always already being at a world. And this background state is irreducible to cognitive acts, or, or for that matter, to any particular act. Um, I think in, in uh, this sense, this actually resonates uh, uh, very well with Denis's paper uh, this morning and his discussion of, uh, of uh, what, what, what did you call them? Hi hypercognitions or something like that. Okay, so where the appropriation thesis treats cognitive acts as derivative of and dependent on other particular but non-cognitive intentional acts, the founding thesis claims that cognitive acts are founded in a prior disclosure of the world as a whole. In fact, from the perspective of the founding thesis, other non-cognitive intentional acts are on a par with cognition in the sense that they too are only possible on the basis of a prior disclosure of the world. Okay, so I'll come back later to the founding thesis. I, I wanna start by looking in more detail at Heidegger's account of the appropriation thesis because I, th I think that will help us get a clearer sense of what Heidegger's talking about when he's talking about cognition. Okay, so section 1.2, the appropriation thesis. Heidegger's primary example of a non-cognitive form of intentional action is what he calls circumspective concern or circumspective coping, uh, umsichtiger um, um, umgang. Um, other examples of non-cognitive forms of comportment include our ability to coordinate and cooperate with other humans and our ability to form and express selfhood. Uh, but I'll be focusing on circumspective coping, which is basically our, our ability to fluidly engage with equipment and equipmental context. Okay, so 1.2.1, circumspective coping is a stance that responds to context-dependent fluctuating solicitations to act. The best illustration of circumspective coping is found in cases of skillful fluid immersion in a course of activity. When I'm immersed in an activity that matters to me, Heidegger claims, the world that I inhabit is not made up of a current object. It's made up of a volatile, fluctuating network of opportunities for action. As Heidegger explains in quote nine, in indicatively addressing something, this table here, that window over there, the chalk, the door, information about them is already contained. What does this information consist in? Answer, that the entities concerned are discovered in terms of that for which they are useful. They are already situated in an interpretation. They are endowed with significance. Don't understand this to mean that we are first given a something that's free of any significance to which a signification could be stuck on. Rather, what is first of all given, in a sense that's yet to be made determinate, is the for writing, the for going in and out, the for illuminating, the for sitting. That is, writing, going in and out, sitting, and the like, are that within which we move from the very start. What we know when we know our way around, and what we learn, are these useful for witches. Um, so in our normal active immersion in the world, what we first of all encounter are for witches. We don't encounter objects with properties. Uh, we don't even, strictly speaking, encounter a chalkboard for writing or a table for sitting at. What's first of all given is an invitation to act. And in a marginal note to the passage I just read, Heidegger makes this point even more emphatically. This is uh, passage 10 on the handout. A chalkboard is unintelligible. As a chalkboard, it's not even present. Unless it's understood as a for writing, it's concealed. The same with a door, it's, it's for going in and out. This for which is graspable because we ourselves are moved into it so naturally that we altogether forget the for which and its basic structure for the constitution of things." Quote. Um, now Heidegger dubs entities that are constituted by the actions or movements they invite us to perform 
the available or the ready to hand in the Macquarie and Robinson translation. The basic ontological structure of the available consists of what it invites us to do. Heidegger calls this, uh, calls the thing's invitation to action, its affordance, uh, bewandtness is the German. Uh, it gets translated as involvement in Macquarie and Robinson, but that doesn't say anything. And, um, and then in addition, the entities I encounter in concernful action are organized into a structure of references that direct me from one affordance to the next. So for experience, uh, so for instance, I experience not a door object, but an affordance for going out, which directs or pulls me onto an affordance for going down, that is the stairwell, which directs me uh, onto uh, the rest, uh, an affordance for eating, right, the dining room and so on. Uh, Heidegger explains that the for which contains networks of re references in which concern is moved, that's quote 11, or as he puts it in quote 12, the world is encountered in the living flow and pull of life. A situation made up of affordances and references, moreover, is holistic in the sense that we don't encounter and respond to individual things piecemeal. The for writing, strictly speaking, is not identical with the chalkboard. The affordance for writing encompasses the relationship between the board and the position of the desks and the size and hardness of the chalk and the lighting conditions and so on. So as Heidegger observes in 13, concernful coping never dwells on an individual item of equipment. Our using and manipulating of any definite item of equipment as such remains oriented toward an equipmental context. And that's why Heidegger calls the site that discloses our everyday world circumspection, umsicht, uh, literally constantly looking around, taking in a whole network of affordances and discovering solicitations to act in response to the invitations to act that I encounter. The action that responds to the way I'm drawn to move by the network of, of uh, references and affordances, Heidegger insists, is fundamentally in non-cognitive mode of intentional comportment, even if it does often involve uh, cognitive moments or aspects. Now to see why, let's turn squarely to Heidegger's account of cognition. This is 1.2.2. Cognition is a stance that thematizes, fixes on objects, and makes determinate a content that's abstractable. Cognition, Heidegger argues, involves a fundamental stance on the world that interrupts the fluid, skillful response to the contexts of affordances that we've just described. Heidegger offers a phenomenological description of what it's like to enter into a cognitive relation to the things around us. And on this phenomenological account, cognition has a, what he calls a tiered structure. We move from circumspective coping to full-blown cognition in a series of steps, steps that take us from a, a less to a more fully cognitive structuring of experiences. He identifies five stages on the scale, which I've set out in uh, section 14 of the handout. Uh, first, the lowest grade of cognition is focusing on or fixing on something in particular, where fluid action is guided by a constant scanning or looking around, sich uh, umsehen, cognition is guided by a looking at, hinsehen, uh, whereas circumspective coping is a fluid response to an unfolding situation as it's moved smooth, smoothly from one affordance to the next, cognition gets arrested on a discrete fe feature of that situation. Rather than allowing itself to respond, cognition is a directing oneself, a specific comportment of taking up a direction towards something. Grade two involves lingering with that on which Dasein is now focused, where circumspective coping is constantly moving it never dwells with any individual item of equipment, Heidegger says, but is guided from one reference to the next. Cognition stays with the discrete feature that it's picked out. Uh, by abstaining from any manipulation or use, Heidegger writes, an examination of the current thing is carried out. At stage three, this examination or interrogation of the object disjoins it, isolating it and teasing it apart from the context in which it appears at the fourth grade of cognition, uh, we get involved in developing the stage three cognition in such a way that a content can be extracted from the feature that's fixed on, lingered over, and isolated. 
Heidegger describes this as the examining developing itself in such a way that it, quote, takes custody of that which was examined, end quote. So cognition becomes, in this way, an act of making determinate or interpreting it in a determinate sense. And then finally, at stage five, cognition takes its consummate form when the extracted content is preserved and kept, uh, quote, in such a way that cognition has what has been cognized even when it's not currently standing in relation to it. It preserves cognition as its possession. The object of cognition is now capable of being expressed in propositions and retained and preserved as what has been asserted. Now, again, this is in marked contrast to circumspective coping, which is intimately dependent on the concrete situation in which it finds itself to guide its movements. So at this ultimate stage, cognition takes its object into its possession by grasping in the object upon which it fixes an abstractable content, be it a conceptual, categorical, propositional, or formal content. Because cognition is capable of viewing individual objects in isolation from their contexts of use, it brings about, Heidegger says, a determinate de-worlding of the world. And in advancing through the stages of cognition, we effect a changeover from discovering available entities to discovering a current or present at hand entities. Cognition, Heidegger notes, is a determination of the occurrent through contemplative observation. But while cognition tends towards securing its results in a propositional content, I think it's a mistake to think that it's the content that ultimately defines cognition. What's definitive of cognition for Heidegger is that uh, it, it involves, as he says in quote 15, the development of a new stance of being towards what is cognized. It's cognition is oh, uh, really cognizing is probably the better way to think of it. It's a way of being in the world and not a method or procedure by which a subject procures representation. And uh, that means that it's no objection to Heidegger's account to observe quite correctly that our circumspective coping often involves representational or conceptually mediated states and acts. Uh, for example, beliefs, the making of assertions, the aiming at goals, perceiving that such and such is the case, and so on. What is determinative for Heidegger is whether those cognitive elements are subsumed under a non-cognitive stance of, of coping with the world, or whether they're elements of a cognitive way of being in the world. Okay, 1.2.3, the priority of circumspective coping over cognition. So Heidegger's appropriation thesis is a thesis about the priority of non-cognitive stances in discovering the entities that we encounter in our day-to-day -day dealings. According to the appropriation thesis, when a cognizing subject fixes on a current entities, what she first of all fixes on are aspects of the world that are relevant to our circumspective coping. And this is quote 16. Uh, he writes, the kind of dealing which is closest to us is, as we've shown, not a cognition that merely examines, but rather a concern that manipulates things and puts them to use. By taking up a cognitive stance, however, the available entities that are discovered through circumspection, a circumspective concern withdraw from view, and we find ourselves switched over to current entities. Uh, to illustrate the switchover, Heidegger calls our attention to a certain type of assertoric speech act. And we need to be careful here. Heidegger is expressly not claiming that all speech acts that have the syntactic structure of an assertion are expressions of a cognitive stance. He notes, for instance, in passage 17, that the kind of interpretation which is circumspectively expressed is not necessarily an assertion in the sense we have defined. So when, for example, a carpenter says to her assistant, the hammer is too heavy, the speech act doesn't serve to thematize the hammer. It instead reorients the carpenter's assistant to the affordances of the workshop. For Heidegger, it's a failing of traditional logic that rather than starting with su such circumspectively engaged speech acts, it begins instead with thematizing assertions. Uh, a thematizing assertion, or as Heidegger sometimes calls it, an exhibiting assertion, is a speech act that exhibits or points out a, a discrete object. These assertions, Heidegger argues, are in fact borderline cases, but as he puts it in 18, they function in logic as the normal cases. 
and as the examples of the simplest assertion phenomena. Heidegger, by contrast, views such speech acts not as the simplest, but as a worked up and derivative phenomena, and for him, an illustration of the appropriation thesis. So he explains, this is uh, the lengthy passage 19, uh, the entity which is held in an intention, for instance, the hammer, is at first available as equipment. If this entity becomes the object of insertion, then, and, and this is, I think, the important line here, then as soon as we begin to make an assertion of this type, there is an advance, a changeover in the intention, right? So it's not the assertion that makes the changeover. It's, it's the changeover in the intention that allows the assertion to function in the way that it does. So something available with which we have to do something turns into something about which one makes an exhibiting assertion. Our focus is aimed at something current in what is available, both by taking up this perspective and for this perspective, the available thing is as an available thing is veiled within this discovering of incurrentness, which simultaneously is a concealing of availableness. The current thing that we encounter is determined in its currently being in such and such a manner, only now does access to something like properties open up. Okay, so according to the appropriation thesis, cognition is derivative of non-cognitive modes of intentionality because it inherits its objects and its initial content from these non-cognitive modes. Uh, 1.3, now the, the thesis of founding uh, now that we have a more developed account of how Heidegger understands cognition, let's return to the founding thesis. Of this thesis, Heidegger notes in passage 20, this already being involved with, in which alone cognition can live at all, is not first produced directly by a cognitive performance. Rather, human existence, whether it ever recognizes it or not, is already involved with a world. We should note that it's not just cognitive comportment that's founded on a prior understanding of the world. In passage 21, he, he reminds us that all sight, including circumspection, is primarily grounded in understanding. But what is understanding? And here, this is the, maybe the most important uh, quote, and I forgot to put it on the handout, so <laughs> I'll read it twice. Uh, Heidegger defines understanding as projection onto possibilities. He says, the understanding always penetrates into possibilities because understanding has in itself the existential structure that we call projection. Okay, so without projection onto possibilities, there is no understanding and vice versa. Um, okay, section 1.3.1, uh, the distinction between possible events and possibilities. To understand Heidegger's account of the understanding as a projection onto possibilities, uh, we need to observe his distinction between possible events, or das Mögliche, right, literally that which is possible, and possibilities proper, die Möglichkeit. A possible event is a particular happening, which when it happens occurs in a specific space-time region of a world. So, for example, a particular happening is Abby mixes yeast into warm water in her kitchen at noon on January 25th, 2023. A particular happening is a possible, a, a possible event if it's consistent with prior and subsequent states of the world. A possible event thus has a specificity and a determinacy to it. The only difference between a possible event and its actualization is the modality. So for this reason, Heidegger often refers to possible, possible events as a possible actual. By contrast, a possibility proper is a type of event. Uh, we might call an event type a second order possibility since it organizes particular happenings or first order possibilities into a class. So for example, uh, as I said, Abby mixing flour and yeast in her kitchen at noon is a particular happening. Abby baking in her kitchen is a possibility that organizes a variety of particular happenings into a class of potential actualizations of the possibility. And being a pastry chef, is a yet higher order possibility. It organizes the modal space within which action types make sense as particular ways of behaving in furtherance of a personal identity or a social role. So other action types which make up a range of possibilities that define being a pastry chef include baking torts, kneading dough, glazing cinnamon rolls, cleaning pans, and, and we could go on indefinitely. 
when Heidegger talks about human possibility, he usually has in mind a higher order possibility, a, a possibility of engaging in a type of comportment. So we can say that a Heideggerian possibility is a coherent modal space. It's a way of organizing and giving sense to some range of comportments. Any one of a number of different particular happenings can actualize such a possibility. And, and that, again, is in contrast to particular events. There's only one event that's the actualization of a possible event. And if a possible event is actualized, it's actualized in a single determinate happening in a specific time, place, and manner. But no particular happening in which a possibility is actualized exhausts the possibility. As Heidegger explains in his lecture course on logic in 1925, uh, this is passage 24, whenever Dasein comports itself in a determinate type of comportment, this remains only one possible way of comporting. That is, it can, as a matter of principle, be given up. Dasein can, as a matter of principle, enter upon a different way of comportment. Thus, possibility is a determination that belongs as a matter of principle to the ways of comporting. And in that case, the possibility does not disappear when a determinate comportment is factically chosen and lived. And that point's reiterated in Being in Time, uh, where Heidegger explains that, uh, and these aren't on the handouts, um, apologies, that as factical Dasein, Dasein has in each case already diverted its ability to be into a possibility of understanding. But when one is diverted into one of these basic possibilities of understanding, the other is not discarded. And that means that possibilities, unlike possible events, are not contained within the stream of events that make up any given world. While possibilities are actualized by particular happenings, they're not, properly speaking, ever actual themselves. The, a possibility doesn't happen, but any of an indefinite number of happenings can be the actualization of a possibility. Uh, in the vernacular of worlds theory, you might say that a Heideggerian possibility is a trans-world object. It's the sort of thing that allows us to recognize relationships between entities, including relations to similar entities in different worlds. But the possibilities can't be actualized at a world. There are relations between possible worlds. If one were to say that higher order possibilities exist, remember these are possibilities like the possibility of being a pastry chef or the possibility of being an authentic individual, if we were to say that such possibilities exist, then they exist not by being actualized, but simply when they contribute to the overall sense of a world. We encounter them through the significance they give to our actions, whether they're actually being instantiated at any given moment or not. So Heideggerian possibilities are ways of making sense of particular events, and they structure our experience of the world even when we don't actualize them. We grasp the significance of the way Abby instantiates being a pastry chef precisely because we understand her actions in the context of other ways to actualize that possibility, as well as in the context of other identities she could have pursued but didn't. 1.3.2, the ontologically foundational character of possibilities. A set of Heideggerian possibilities make up what Heidegger calls the horizon of choice or the region of projection. That is, the field of alternatives that fix the meaning of any given choice by holding it in relation to other similar or contrasting or alternative choices. Regions of projection are, for Heidegger, ontologically basic. Any given entity is what it is because of the profile it has when we project it onto possibilities. In other words, we understand the being of an entity by seeing it in terms of a horizon of possibilities. In passage 25, uh, Heidegger explains that in the projecting of the understanding, entities are disclosed in their possibility. The character of the possibility corresponds on each occasion with the kind of being of the entity which is understood. So one might sum up the view in this way. To be is to inhabit a chunk of modal space, and possibilities are ontologically fundamental for Heidegger. 1.3.3, the non-cognitive character of authentic projection. One relates to possible events by awaiting or expecting them. E expectation is a term of art for Heidegger. To expect a possible event is to have one's actions shaped by a sense for whether, when, and how the event will actually occur. 
or alternately with regard to what will prevent it from happening. Expectation can be, but need not be a cognitive state. That is, we can believe that or think that Abby will mix yeast into warm water in her kitchen at noon. But more often our grasp of possible events does not involve a thematic mental awareness of what's possible given the current state of the world. Rather, Heidegger says, and this is 26, it consists in concerning ourselves with the actualization of the possible event by circumspectively looking away from the possible event to that for which it is possible. Um, that's a funny idea, but I, I think it's straightforward. So for instance, because I anticipate Abby making dough, the dirty mixing bowl shows up as soliciting me to clean it. That is, I look away from the possible event of Abby making dough to that for which this is a possibility. That is the affordance made up of the mixing bowl in the kitchen. But from what we said about possibilities, Heidegger concludes that a projection onto possibilities necessarily cannot be a cognitive state. And this is uh, quote 27, understanding is not a kind of cognition, but a primary kind of being of being, of being in the world itself. A possibility by its very nature exceeds any particular way of representing or expecting its actualization. To even try to cognize the possibility as a possibility, to thematize it, this is quote 28, would take away from what is projected its very character as a possibility and would reduce it to the given contents which we have in mind. Whereas projection and throwing throws before itself the possibility and lets it be as such. Okay, so to cognize a possibility turns it into a possible event, basically. Uh, rather than demanding a fixed conception of what counts as actualizing a possibility, an authentic understanding of possibility tends toward an ever greater expansion of our grasp of the open-ended ways in which any given possibility can be actualized. And this is 29 on the handout. This approach, Heidegger writes, does not tend toward a concernful making available of something actual, but rather in coming closer understandingly, the possibility of the possible, but rather, sorry, but rather in coming closer understandingly, the possibility of the possible event only becomes greater. The nearest nearness of being to a possibility is as far removed as possible from anything actual. Now, this doesn't mean that our understanding of a possibility is something vague uh, our understanding of possibilities is not interior or mental. It's distributed over the world, so to speak. And we give concrete content to our understanding of a possibility by seeing how it could be enacted giving, given the existing equipmental contexts. At the same time, the more authentic our understanding of the possibility is, the more open we are to new and unexpected ways of realizing or instantiating that possibility. I think the phenomenon Heidegger has in mind when he's talking about this expansive way of projecting possibilities is something like what Kierkegaard had in mind when he posed the question in all of Christendom, are there any Christians? And, and I think Jonathan Lear's book, A Case for Irony, is a, a brilliant working out of the same uh, phenomenon or intuition. So uh, Kierkegaard in asking whether in all of Christendom there are any Christians was alluding to an experience in which we discover that no amount of compliance with established norms and social expectations will realize what it really means to be a Christian. And that shows that the possibility of being Christian exceeds any rule governed, propositionally articulable concept. Okay, uh, section 1.4, uh, I should say, I suppose, penultimate conclusion, uh, the early Heidegger on cognition and ontology. Okay, so we can now quite simply explain Heidegger's critique of traditional ontology because of the philosophical tendency to take cognition as the primary form of intentionality, Heidegger contends that most philosophical ontology has a distorted account of the nature of being. When in a cognitive stance, one quite naturally takes the world to have the specific type of ontological structure that's needed to sustain cognition, but this is precisely to miss or obscure the ontological structures that are opened up through non-cognitive modes of comportment. This means for one thing that philosophical ontologies tend to miss the kind of being characteristic of the available, right, of affordances, but it also misses the phenomenon of world disclosure, which is a particular style of opening up the possibilities 
that are determinative of the being of entities. And then let me just finish uh, with a postscript on what I should have talked about but didn't get around to. So uh, I'll call this postscript Three Tasks for Thinking in Later Heidegger. Uh, as Heidegger comes to focus in his later works on the dynamics of world disclosure, he revisits the role that thinking can play in opening up a world. One way to understand the difference between historical epochs or worlds is to attend to the distinct regions of possibilities that each world projects into. The Christian Middle Ages worked against the background of a distinct profile of possibilities, possibilities that are largely absent from the horizon of possibilities that shape the contemporary technological world and vice versa. The clearing that shapes a historical world is a clearing because it withholds some possibilities while permitting others. In Heidegger's later work, he gives three main tasks to thinking. First, thinking's able to release us from being swept along in our normal course of activity, in which we unthinkingly operate on the basis of the prevailing understanding of being. This is thinking as Gelassenheit. Second, thinking allows us to attend to the historical ontological style that governs our age, to which style we are ordinarily oblivious. That's thinking as Besinnung in Heidegger's terminology. And then finally, thinking can guide us into new forms of responding to the world, thereby fostering new habits and preparing the way to a new style of opening up, opening up the world. Thinking, Heidegger says uh, in his later works, founds the preliminary exercise for dwelling. It founds the first habit that starts a change in the way we open up an understanding of being. Thank you. <laughs>